everybody and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. This is our Pitch Fest 2021 series where we chat to the people and founders behind these incredible startups from last year's Pitch Fest. We'll find out more about what it is they do and most importantly, what they've been up to since Pitch Fest 2021. I'm your co-host, Amelia Helt, and as usual, I'm joined by our fearless co-founder, Tim Silverwood. Hi, Tim. Hi, Amelia. Here we go. Episode three. It's exciting to be chewing through these awesome episodes. It's fantastic. And I'm so excited that we have 12 of these coming out for people to watch. So you're currently listening to number three, but stay tuned because we have so much more to come. That's it. Lots of great startups and lots of great founders. That's it. And today we have Akwai um, and the founders, uh, Simeon Petakoski and Leanne Thompson. Fascinating chat and, you know, two very fun people and very well put together for the time of day that they were recording. <laughs> That's right. These guys, we only obviously have a small window during work hours here in Australia, but that means if you're in Norway, uh, it turns out about 9 a.m. my time is about 1 a.m. their time. So I thought they looked fantastic and had incredible positive spirit given it was so early in the morning. They were very fresh-faced, but Simeon did say, or Leanne might have said about Simeon, that, uh, you know, they've kind of got this uh, kind of mad inventor, um, you know, as many creatives are, thing going on where you do work these unusual hours and that oftentimes the night is when they're most creative. So uh, it may have worked in their favour also. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, uh, gee, how's about these inventions that you know, Simeon and Leanne have been working on and obviously the one that you'll see if you follow the show notes or do some Googling is these incredible robotic UAVs that look like fish, right? So this is all about gaining more data from the ocean and particularly using it in certain industries because unless you're out there looking and using sensors to find this information, then we just don't know and we can't keep looking at how we can improve the health of the ocean if we don't actually know anything about it. So I love this conversation. Yeah, it's a very cool invention that's so data-driven uh, but also just looks fascinating and people will get a real kick when they uh, check out the show notes or do some Googling. But, you know, this is a, a an underwater drone, let's call it, that unlike other drones, uses biomimicry. So theirs are fish-like and they're kind of flexible, meaning that they can move more like a fish and result in less disruption to real fish and the surrounding environment. And then the drone collects and delivers this real-time visual environmental data, which people can access through a online dashboard. So where a company may be a SaaS business, which is software as a service, they're actually a FAS business, which is fish as a service, which I thought was very clever and also describes the product fantastically. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I found fascinating in that biomimicry is I'm sure they've found that biomimicry really powerful in designing a very efficient unit because obviously nature's figured out how to do these things over such a long period of time. But what's been a lovely maybe side uh, effect is that the fish in these aquaculture settings, which they're trying to monitor and get good data from, love their little companion, their little robot fish that's swimming side by side. So you're actually getting much more real evidence as opposed to fabricated and altered evidence, which I found as fascinating. Yes, because apparently with you know other units that don't look like this and, and don't use this kind of biomimicry, they can result in, um, you know, issues with fish stocks. So a lot of what they're doing at the moment, a big part of the industry that they're in is aquaculture and um, that's uh, just a huge benefit. Yeah, and really fascinating that obviously as a startup and these guys really do unveil some of those challenges and obviously achievements of being, they're actually a couple as well, right? So they add that complexity to running a startup. But really following the winds of opportunity. So they're currently based in Norway because there is huge aquaculture markets in Norway that are utilising their products. But as they declare, they do want to diversify the business and the technology in future. And they've got this wonderful willingness to continue following those tides of opportunity wherever in the world they can make their greatest positive impact. So you couldn't really ask for a better example of two ocean impact founders than these, these guys. 
Exactly. And, you know, their ambitions and visions for Acquire is far beyond what they can do even now, which is a lot, um, in this effort to save the seas, which is their, you know, their vision. And I would say my big takeaway from this episode was never doubt the power of children because much like we saw with Jeff from Literati in episode one, Simeon's daughter came to her inventor father after learning about climate change and said, make something that saves the seas. And he did. And, um, you know, now they're trying to grow that and it's so at the heart of their mission, which was all inspired by uh, their daughter. Yeah, truly inspirational stuff. And yeah, I can't wait to see where the uh, series for Pitch Fest 2021 takes us next. But yeah, really enjoyed this conversation. So I hope you do too. Enjoy it, everyone. And remember to leave us a comment or a review wherever you get your podcasts from. And we look forward to hearing what you took away from this incredible episode. I'm very excited to have on the Ocean Impact podcast, Pitch Fest 2021 series, the founders of Aquai. We have Simeon Pitakoski, who's the Chief Visionary Officer and one of the founders, and we also have Leanne Thompson, the CEO. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Norway. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having us. It's uh, great to be here. We should probably flag that it's morning in Australia, but very, very early in the morning, i.e. close to midnight in Norway where you guys are. Can you tell us exactly where you are in Norway for the people listening in? Oh, at the moment, we are in Oslo. Um, it is early morning, um, about 1 a.m., but, you know, you would never be able to be doing this conversation with us at any time after <laughs> 6 a.m., between 6 a.m. and noon, because as most inventors are they're usually in the lab working late at night so for for Simeon anyway this is ideal time and we tend to actually work a lot with um you know a lot of our um partners are in California or New York so we we do kind of have these global hours so for us it's actually quite okay that we're we're doing this now people might be just listening to the audio but if you do see the video they look incredibly fresh given it's close to 1 a.m in the morning <laughs> Just practice. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Aquai, um, specifically what the ocean challenge it is that you're seeking to solve and maybe tell us what that problem is and, and how big it is. You want me to do this? No, okay. do. So um, in a nutshell, we are reducing the cost of harnessing information from waterways. Um, I think what's unique about Aquai is how we do that. But in essence, you know, w systems that are operating in waterways, whether it's salt water or fresh water, um, they just tend to be incredibly expensive. So for us, it was all about building affordable technology with which to harness data or information so that uh, those working in, you know, the blue economy, if you will, will have affordable tools to uh, operate sustainably. Fantastic. Okay, so let's go back. Um, the startup dates back to about 2014, but Simeon, you've been working in robotics and technology like this for quite some time. Maybe give us a little bit of that backstory as to why this, this pivot took place to looking at water systems, and maybe that's a good way to lead into this why it is the Aqua exists. Well, my background originally is in animatronics. That was coming from South Africa. And when I relocated to the Middle East, there wasn't really anything in the animatronics field. So I had to redesign myself. So I became more of a, a designer, so to speak. And that led me to further in, in the field of robotics and much more, I would say, into the HRI category, which is you, you're basically building a machine and putting it out in the public and understanding what the public's reactions to that machine is. Um, one Christmas, or I'd say summer Christmas, my our daughter came to, to me and said, hey, Dad, I'm doing a project on the oceans, and uh, I would like you to save the oceans. And that's where essentially that little spark went off, well, how do I actually go about saving the oceans? I mean, because we can all talk about it, but essentially the – the end point of that discussion or, or that thought pattern was, okay, well, what's been around for many years? And that led to the fish, and the fish is basically a vertebrate species. So essentially, I took that easy approach, and I left the scientists 
a part of it out of the equation and I just put the consumer part into it. Meaning, so yeah, in terms of the affordability, it, it was really about using biomimicry. So, you know, Simeon's um, a, a little bit shy in that he, or humble, I guess is a better way of putting it, that he has always, you know, created technologies that are in the climate space or to help others. Having stumbled onto his first climate conference at the age of 12 in Cape Town, where he's from, pretty much from that moment on, all of his inventions, whether they were water filtration devices or nose filters, were around how to understand the climate and how to um, help humanity, but also helping humanity doesn't mean making systems that most cannot afford. Um, so it was always uh, a, a technology that that was accessible to all and was easy to use and affordable. And I just want to say that I actually met Simeon while doing a story on him because my previous life is that of a journalist. So I actually was, was researching and doing a story on Simeon, who was known as Q, like in, you know, James Bond 007 Q guy the guy who made all the cool gadgets. Well, he was essentially the Q and um, that's how we met. Um, but yeah, his, it's all, the device is a robotic fish looking platform that affordably harnesses data in the waterways. So going back again then to that moment when you brought your incredible skill set and insight to look at the ocean space and you saw this inspiration of the fish were you building those first prototypes, that first technology, as a means to go and collect affordable data? Is that always the original brief, or did it pivot and change along the way? No, I, it's always been part of the journey. Um, I would say it's a mixture of the collection of data, the affordable approach, but also the, the expense, to bring down that expense. So what we really did was we basically compared it to what you have in the military or what you have in oil and gas. And that whole trick was to tr take what they have and to bring it down to a price point that everybody can afford it. And so that was the number one concentration. Those three little categories were, I would say, on the top of the, the, the list. Okay, great. So... At that stage then when you started to see the technology having some, some merit and potential, who were some of those first target customers and how did it go from the lab and actually into the real world and into the hands of, of customers? I'll tell you the first part. This, we really don't work on the lab point of view. We, we design it without what I would call without the R&D and much more manufacturing in mind straight from the prototype stage into the manufacturing stage. And that requires a lot of due diligence, a lot of knowledge along the way, and essentially go from a table into a live environment. So we were always, you know, throwing the robots in the water right away. <laughs> and, the, you know, the, the various prototypes. But um, the initial one, uh, the first one we unveiled in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 2015, was one that resembled the most like uh, the Nemo clownfish and it could tweet uh, your picture. So that was the extent of what that unit could do. And then other prototypes were maybe faster or had different, different swim patterns. Um, you know, we found it a quay in uh, overlooking Monterey Bay in, in Las Gatos on the summit there. Um, and so we tested live, as Simeon's saying, a lot in Monterey Bay or in like a little kiddie pool or whatever we could, you know, get our hand or wherever we could throw the, the unit in the water. Um, the first, the first uh, initial thought was, okay, well, maybe we can make it for swimming pools or maybe we could make it for the tourist centers and hotels and whatnot. Um, Simeon also comes from, you know, a background of lights and lasers and stuff. So we had lights on it. It was doing all this cool stuff. Um, then we were actually approached by a global reinsurer uh, who saw the potential as a risk mitigating technology. And for us, that meant that we could fast forward and not just, you know, because initially it was like, OK, we can get some money this way and then we'll grow the unit uh, gradually to address the, the real reason why we're doing this. That allowed us to kind of fast forward into creating a unit that had, you know, more uh, 
uh, targeting in terms of data uh, harnessing. And that was for the reinsurers. Um, they took a considerable amount of time, this particular uh, group, and you know that wanted to use our units and ports here in, in Europe. And while they were taking time as a startup, you know, you have cash flow to think about. So at that moment, I actually saw a documentary called A Fish on Your Plate that featured a, an utmost sustainable aquaculture farm in the north of Norway that I sent a 30-second clip to and said, here's our robot fish. What do you think? They loved it. And they said, come. And we did. And we did you know, trials. And then we went back and spent two months on, uh, on the farm on their island in the Arctic Circle and you know, built a handful of robots, 3D printing, which is what our robots are when you 3D print them. And that pretty much led us in the direction of aquaculture, although we never viewed ourselves as an aquaculture company. But, you know, as a startup, you can make your idea, your product, your service. But the next question is, OK, great, but who's going to pay for it? And this industry was really keen to um, to uh, to adopt and uh, our units and um, saw it as a natural fit that a robot fish would monitor live fish. And that's how we kind of got into that industry first. Although in, since then, we have quite a few other use cases that are coming our way. So again, we look at our, we don't view ourselves as an aquaculture. It's one of the markets we're in, but more as a, um, you know, an ocean climate tech company. Yeah, I'm sure people that are fascinated by this conversation so far and already madly Googling images of your technology and watching videos of it in action will most likely come across examples of it being used in aquaculture. But maybe you could give us a little bit of an insight into what portion of your business is being um, utilised for, for aquaculture at the moment and, and, and maybe where some of those other use cases and projections of where the business may go in the future are, if you wouldn't mind sort of talking to that a little bit. Sure. Um, so there, we do have a YouTube channel. So just putting that out there, <laughs> if you want to look at it, the fish that you will see in the YouTube channel will be a, 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 a tethered robot, which um, is not being controlled by the tether. It is just transmitting and charging through the tether. So the units are all semi-autonomous. They swim based on a mission run or using GPS waypoints and um, computer vision for navigation and so forth. Um, aquaculture is, again, our entry market. It is where we have the bulk of our purchase orders coming from. Um, that said, we have been asked now also to do some pilots in kelp farms, which we're excited about, which is also aquaculture, but also in detecting subsurface coastal plastics is another um, use case that we're setting up pilots to do. As you, or if you don't, I'm, I'm, some of the, the listeners may or, or probably already know this, that not all plastics in the ocean are floating uh, uh, on the surface. A lot, most of it is actually under, below the surface or um, beneath a bit of sand or debris. So we're actually able to then detect where those patches are subsurface, send out the information uh, through GPS uh, geolocation so that people can pick up the trash uh, before it turns into microplastics. Um, other use cases we've been asked to do would be in actually recently um, in tourism. Uh, you have a lot of uh, floating hotels or hotels that have, you know, subsurface or, um, or they need their infrastructure or their corals. So when you're, when you look at a robotic fish that ha that swims, you know, much like real fish and, you know, taking 20, 20 million years of evolution, which is what we did in, in, in our bio-inspired robot, um, we're, we are able to maneuver around corals. So it's ideal for, for conservation purposes and, and monitoring habitat. So these are some new use cases that we're really excited about. I think Simeon's favorite one, which we haven't yet done, is in what? Flooding? Flooding. You want to definitely, explain? I see that's the the the, the long term for us. Is definitely a flooding situation where pre and post you definitely need data coming in, either for the city as a as a water management tool or the first responders as 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 a data tool. 
to see what, how messy it really is inside the waterway. Um, and that would be basically done in freshwater all the way out to the salt or ocean. Wow. We've just had some very severe flooding where I am on the east coast of Australia and, you know, still the water quality is poor many, many, many weeks after the effect. Um, how does that work in such a uh, polluted and um, you know, turbulent waterways? How, how can you, is it, is it just using the sensors to capture that technology and relying less on the camera? So mostly the sensors. I mean, we, I mean, we do have techniques to slow down the unit, but we really don't try and travel fast. So, and then again, I have to say that it's been a bonus being in Norway because you really don't get stronger seas than the Norwegian seas. Um, it's extremely hectic and any day could be a violent day. There's no way of, of predicting it. So having been here, it's allowed us to actually build a better, better stronger system that can handle you know, super storms or, or flooding events that are, are rapid. And this was one of the use cases of the, why the reinsurer approached us is because there's oftentimes a loss of life when they send out their employees to do water toxicity uh, detections or level monitoring because you can't have you know people move, going back into areas that have been flooded because of the toxicity. So the way it works is that a, a unit such as our, rather than a, a human having to, you know, you can throw a unit in and they will be and leave it there swimming and they'll be able to get their reports um, constantly and, and, you know, on their web dashboard so that they can then determine when it's safe to go back or to allow citizens to move back. Let's talk a little bit about sort of your competitors and, and really what makes, you know, the point of difference with, with your technology. Obviously, it's the, the biomimicry and the agility of the unit because looking, obviously, at other UAVs and devices, very, very restrictive, I suppose, on how they can manoeuvre through, for example, coral reefs, like you mentioned, and going into those aquaculture settings, not being able to get uh, a real snapshot of the situation because they're going to be deterring the fish. Maybe just talk a little bit about some of those competitors and those point of differences that you guys focus on. Oh, buddy. I'm, okay. I'm usually so, the guy that sits at the back of the lab, just putting okay. it out there. <laughs> so first and foremost, there's the cost, right? We do, as the platform has, a, you know, payload of cameras and sensors from salinity, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, depth. And, you know, when we're outside the cage, we can use sonar. We have a side scanner, DVL, IMU, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting many others, but, uh, you know, you can see the new version, which um, is in Unman's uh, Systems Technology magazine I sent you, has a great feature on us and the new unit, which has no tether at all. Um, and it's much more souped up and on par to, you know, what you see, as Simeon said, with oil and gas and Navy without the cost. So our patents are in our mechanic and design, and we 3D and SLS print uh, our units um, using a new form of manufacturing has also enabled us to keep the price point down. And because there are so few screws, it also keeps maintenance costs down. So affordability is one of the main differentiators, um, no matter what the you know what we're monitoring. The other would be in the case of the fish farms, for instance. Right now, I mean, there are lots of technologies. Um, operating now in, in these fish farms, especially here in Norway, where they are, they're very sophisticated. Um, and uh, one of the key differences still remains, whether you have a zapper or whether you have these you know, $250,000 devices to do biomass or lice detection, whatever, you still have a cage that's from 120 to 190 you know, meters in circumference and the fish are swimming and these devices have a hard time still locating where the bulk of the fish are hanging out, if you will. So but with our unit, we swim right next to them. They kind of adopt us as like mama fish. It's really funny. But the second we're in there, they swim around us. Maybe it's the indolate, you know, the, 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 the way the tail is moving. But they really embrace us as one of them, if you will. So we're able to get up really close. So when you harness data, proximity to the source is everything. And, you know, the best data is clearly, even if you need to manipulate it, in machine learning or whatever on the back end, you still need, you know, the better raw data you have, the better visual or environmental. 
So that's one of the key differentiators. We're also able to do net inspection, you know, visually. We can send out first alerts. We can go different depths. So unlike those that are sensors that are on a buoy, we're able to go to the, all the different depths to report the water quality, which is in Norway anyway mandated. So, you know, it, it's that really, it's that kind of like that John Deere super tool for the farmer. Plus, you know, I deployed it in less than five minutes and 45 knot winds on the side of a cage myself. So it's very lightweight. It's built like Lego. It's ma- modular. So if, let's say, something goes off on the tail, it's easy just to send a new tail and you snap it back in. So, it, you know, it's operational that way. Um, so that's how it works in aquaculture. And I think, you know, again, the fact that it's the lightweight, the fact that it's you don't need a whole team to deploy like most AUVs out there, the fact that we can swim on the surface in shallow and medium waters um, is also a differentiator. And, 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 and the other is that we do not work with defense at all. So that allows us to operate in just about any waters because we're not attached to any one government, if you will. Um, so that's another, I think, key differentiator. I would also like to point out definitely our flexibility and the ease of use is definitely separating us because what we end up doing is save saving the farmer or industry a lot of time. For example, a farmer needs a side hand to, to dismantle all the equipment that's there, and most farmers have individual units, and we combine that into all those individual things into one unit. So it's the ease of mind, cost effective for the unit for for the farmer. And for anybody else that's in the scientific area, you usually have to hire a boat, you usually have to hire a team, you usually have to pay for everything. And that's a big budget, even from an organization point of view, from a government organization point of view, that's a huge amount of cost right there. And you haven't even deployed the system yet. And usually those systems are anywhere from 250 to right up to half a million dollars. And that's even on the, the low cost side. Mm. Fascinating stuff. Thanks for all of that. Um, I'd love to go into a question now, which is around sort of key achievements of Akwai, um, of your journey, but also key challenges. And quite often, founders do tend to break them up into quite two distinct responses when you're talking about key achievements and key challenges. And we can definitely speak about this for a little while. So you, over to you, Helen, how you want to start that one. <laughs> okay. I think the main key achievement is that we have been able to just keep going and keep doing this despite, let's say, we're incredibly capital efficient, I guess. So, you know, it's very, before everyone started running around, oh, climate, climate technologies, let's start putting 25K in. You know, it was different, really difficult, still difficult to, to, to raise capital. So the fact that we've been able to achieve all of this with a very, very lean team um, and on, you know, very uh, uh, lean uh, finances, I think is our major key achievement. Also, I think uh, another great achievement is that we have really partnered with uh, and our cu- early customers here are really those who share the same mindset, the same you know, mission, if you will, to you know, preserve, uh, protect waterways, you know, help the planet, if you will, <laughs> sustain humanity um, as best as we can. So I think those are our main key achievements. And the challenges have always been you know, it's always a challenge when you're putting a team together. Our team is incredibly international. You know, Simeon is, is from Cape Town. I'm originally from California. We met in Israel. Um, the team itself has is, you know, from France and Italy, the U.S. I mean, it's just yeah, very international. So it's, it's also um, a challenge finding, uh, you know, people to come together and to be as mobile as well because you know we kind of have this mentality that we have to go where our customers are um and clearly that's why we are here and um i think other challenges just been you know it's been incredibly difficult to um i think push deep tech ocean tech um you know because even if the pie is around climate then it's all about carbon or it's all about you know an app 
Um, it's not really deep tech, climate tech. And then if you put the water element in, I know one investor said to me the other day, uh, you know, water's just so expensive. <laughs> well, operating in water is so expensive, you know. So I think it, it gets frustrating, you know, when or, or, you know, you can't really solve a lot with, you know, these $25,000, you know, awards that are out there or something. I think it's really needs to be a mind shift about, how we handle deep tech, um, you know, hardware that, you know, I think I just read from deal room that um, only, so tw- so the majority of unicorns, climate unicorns are hardware software, but only 20% um, investors out there will consider hardware, right? So you have a very small piece of the pie um in terms of that so that i think you know deep tech hardware climate ocean all of that makes each slice of the pie even a tinier sliver you mentioned there you know the investor sentiment that water is expensive yet you know 71 percent of the planet's surface is water and it's home to the most habitable space on this beautiful blue planet so in your eight-year journey have you seen it get better? We try very, very hard at OIO to create that, you know, to support that nexus between a climate conversation and ocean change. So are you seeing it getting a little bit better? Are some of those people that were reluctant to come on the journey five, seven years ago getting more inclined to see the importance of supporting ocean tech? I think that there are more players involved where I'm discouraged in is that I see a lot more family uh, family offices getting involved, which is great, but they're tr- entrusting. It's not the startup so typically that's getting that capital. It's going into entities that are going to do another study or try to you know have this kind of large overhead of you know, players within their nonprofit or whatever that to fly around and to talk up to the same, to each other at all the different conferences, because that's what happens. It's the same people talking to each other. And I, I, I guess where I would like to see a shift take place is not just, oh yes, we're going to start now doing more in ocean and climate, but that, that, you know, that those family offices actually just go straight to, the those in the muck, those doing the work, and not and, and those creating new innovation into innovation, and not just talking about the that we need to have more innovation, or talking about that we need another study. So that's just coming from those of us who are in innovation. Um, you know whether or not they'll ever adapt adopt you know deep tech, which is complex and hard to wrap your head around. That still has yet to be seen. I mean, the obvious is, I mean, first of all, I'm really chuffed that we've got to the stage that as a company seven started seven years ago, built a fish, most universities are struggling to build their fish, and the only people that really do afford that type of technology is usually the oil and gas or the Navy, which are huge supporters. But we're also living in a time where you need data tools like ours. That's 100% sure. And where to tell you where the market is or where, where the level of interest is, how many AUVs that are collecting data that are not coming from big companies are actually coming from startups working in the water space? Not many. In fact, you can count them on your on two hands. And that is telling you, that's an alarm right there. That's pointing to, out that there's a huge problem. And by now, I wish that we had comp, you know, the, the competition space. But and unfortunately, there the just isn't, which is not healthy. Hmm. That is really, really insightful. And I suppose to, to my previous probing question, it was like, a, could we understand that maybe the pie is getting bigger, but there's no point the pie getting bigger if the slice remains the same size. We need that slice to get bigger and we need it to get deeper so that, like you said, people mucking in um, have got the tools to be supported now, not in years' time. Yeah, and, and, and I mean... We get asked this quite a bit because, you know, as you, I'm sure you've seen as well, over the course of the last few years, there are many more who are operating in this space who are, you know, 
now having accelerators here, acceler- I mean, the number of accelerators that have popped up, you know, significantly in the water space, it didn't exist when we, when we found it Aquai at all. There were only maybe a couple of players. That's great. Um, and new ideas are being fostered. But where there's still a gap uh, is not the idea phase where, oh, let's get them and you know, teach them how to do a deck and, and give them access so that our uh, investors can put in 25K and take a big chunk of the company. But rather, those ideas that have already been proven, like ours, um, the business model and their scale, you know, we have you know, purchase orders for about 100 robots. And just to be able to get those delivered is quite a challenge because it takes capital and that's where they're, you know, you're sure if you've already delivered hundreds and you're a larger company, um, then it'll be no, no problem whatsoever with your, you know, series C, B or A even. But if you're past the idea stage and you have proven and you have people who want it, um, there's that window there that I think is still getting ignored and, 25K isn't going to do it. That's when you need at least, you know, a couple of million. Um, and that's where I think the, 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 you know, there's a big gap. And, and it's not just, I mean, it's a global. I think the, you know, the, the funding into that, that area where you haven't fully produced a handful of them yet, but yet have, have you know, successful pilots and, and, and customers waiting that's the area that needs to be addressed. Very good. Well, that's probably a good segue just to, to maybe if you, if you would like to, to launch into the you know, next 12, 18 months of operations and capital raising ambitions. You know, there's lots of founders and passionate people listening, but there's also investors and people that have networks and connections that maybe you'd like to speak to your, you know, what's on the cards currently and into the next 12 months. Yeah, so our, you know, the main focus is delivering, um, executing, delivering the purchase orders, um, which go across a handful of customers um, in both research and in aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture. Um, And that means that, yeah, we are looking for partners to do that. Um, We need to grow the team. We are looking to set up a more affordable production hub um that uh will enable us to you know grow fa- grow faster basically um and that's our main focus also we you know love to always have a few units for pilots so as i mentioned earlier in, in, in the program we have these subsurface coastal plastic detection pilots and seaweed pilots um we're having conversations with other parts of the world who have these major projects going on um, uh, with tourism and, uh, and aquaculture. So we're really excited about doing some work that, in that as well. And then, you know, once we have a, a few extra, the, the next flood here in Europe, we'll probably just go and throw our fish in the water and, and you know, see, see what happens. <laughs> so that's kind of how we've been doing it. We <laughs> throw it nice. in different markets and see what happens and so that's our goal is to you know to get the train tracks run down so that we can constantly deliver to the existing market we're in one we've already penetrated which is aquaculture and then have a handful of units available with the team to go and do these pilots pay pilots and um and then you know be where we need to be our broader charter i should say has always been what we call the three E's, and that is environmental protection, uh, economic boosting, and an education. And what I mean by that is some of the hardest hit areas um, when it comes to climate change, and which will only prove itself more and more so as we go forward, are those that have, um, are are, are, are more impoverished areas. And so we, we, we want to be able to deploy on a moment's notice with our, our robots or 3D printers, whatever the case may be, and get the local communities to 3D print and assemble right there and put them in the water so that they themselves can also do the water monitoring, empowering the local community and teaching also, um, you know, a bit of robotics, a bit of data and whatnot. So that's kind of like our broader, broader charter, you know, and then ideally 
when we're that, you know, one of those unicorn climate tech companies of hardware, we'll be able to just give our units to the different conservation groups that really need it, but might not necessarily be able to afford it. Because really, at the end of the day, we're all kind of in this together. I think as you pointed out, you know, just in your area alone, and there are many areas right now that are doing the same thing, but for weeks on end, you know, that type, that area is totally devastated, right? You have no infrastructure, there really is an employment, and then what happens usually in, in an area that gets hit hard continuously, or just being continuously filled with pollution, that whole tourism side goes, and then you've got an educational problem. And so our whole challenge is to really bring the education right there to the community. And that's a, you know, a lab, it's an easy movable lab. We've really worked out the easy way of teaching somebody. So it's, we're teaching in a different manner, and it's the same manner that we use on, on a daily basis. As I said right in the beginning, we took out the, the whole scientific approach of making a machine. And we put much more of an easy approach in terms of teaching each other and also explaining it to people. Say, like, for example, a, a, somebody that's working on a fish cage has never worked with a robot before. So you need to, we needed to teach ourselves how to communicate that lesson. Love it. Putting the humans right at the center of it. Um, one of my favorite questions, and this is getting us towards the, the end of the recording, is um, and perhaps from each of you, you know, one or two key learnings from your journey as Ocean Impact founders um, that specifically might help people that are starting their journey or facing some adversity um, at the moment. Never be too confident. <laughs> and this goes back. I mean, it's a funny story, but it's actually the first time that I've seen the walk of death in, in, our, in, in our group. Um, the first time that we went to actually do a test, it was San Diego, nice warm weather. We had a material specialist, part, a really good friend of ours, and he was part of the team, and he still is. And we worked all the, the, the numbers out. We said, okay, fine, this would be totally fine for a very cold environment. And when we got there, as an enthusiastic team, we threw the fish in, and the first thing that happened was that the tail froze. <laughs> totally froze. It was November <laughs> in the Arctic Circle, and yeah, the, San Diego to November. The funny thing is that the next day, we actually had really had to do the test, and it's, and it's an island of 70 people, and they were enthusiastic as well, because nobody's seen a robotic fish. And as a team, the night before, everybody was pondering how they're going to solve this, this problem. Anyway, we did. And the next day, I think it's in one of the YouTube clips, you see me throwing the fish in, and there was this huge sigh of relief when the tail actually started swimming. So never be too confident in the ocean. Yeah, definitely. I think also lessons... Um, Ignore the naysayers. Definitely. I mean, because we've had so many, you know, even people working with us, you know, PhDs, the whole thing, and they're like, this will never work. And then, oh, my gosh, it works. How do you do that? How do you do that? You know? So I, I would, you know, trust your gut, if you, especially if you're doing something that hasn't been done, like, you know, building a robot for, like, very little, like we do, and putting it in the water 24-7. Um, just trust your gut and ignore the naysayers. That's kind of my thing. And, and there's going to be some really bad days. <laughs> if you're doing this, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, yeah. <laughs> because there's no way you'll persevere unless you are just doing it because you're either really batshit crazy or, or really do care about the environment and giving your children and their children uh, a planet that they can love. I'd say from a, from a company point of view, especially in this in in our times that we live in, it's super important to to really make friends with your vendors. I mean, because that's your next approach. You built the unit. Now you need vendors, and they have to supply you. It's very important to have that relationship right from the beginning, because those are the relationships that save the day. That that uniqueness of that bond that you communicate every day or every week. And just to even to say hi, that is actually working out far better for you than any other advice that I could give you. Right at the end of the day, when you need that help super critically and you need their team to help in and step in, then they're there. And they will have you back. 
So it's super important to have to start a communication or dialogue, even a friendship with your vendors. Yeah, oh, that's really great insights, and um, just loving sort of sitting over here on the other side of the planet and your energy and, and the lightness you bring. And there's probably a whole other question there around how, as a couple with, who are also founders, um, interestingly, the next podcast I'll be recording is with a couple who've established a compostable cling film business down in Australia called Great Wrap. And, um, yeah, would you like to speak to that one quickly? Is there any sort of tips for people that are perhaps in a in a couple in a relationship or do we need another whole podcast for that one? Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I think that's where the slice gets even smaller. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because um, we are, you know, a couple of Ivy League schoolers no. who are 30 something and, you know, met in, you know, university to say the word. No, I think um, we back each other up when we need to and we allow each other to flow. And I mean, that's the trick just to allow each other flow with no ego without and just let the other one shine when, when the chances are right. Capital efficiency is much stronger when you're with couples. Because, you know, when, if we put, you know, we put everything in this. So it, when we do and we're calculating, you know, we can share a room when we travel. Right? We can, you know, we can we can really budget differently. Um, and that's also enabled us to come this far because of that. Uh, in terms of working together, I mean, we we've, we've been together, what, 11 years now. So, you know, we I think we got all that. All that stuff, that worked yeah, out. You know, all that stuff worked out. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, in terms of working together, it's 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 perfect. Um, I don't, I don't think it's. I don't think I would want to do it any other way. Especially if, if you're, we're such workaholics that I can't imagine having another partner complaining to me that I'm working all the time on my startup, other than my partner who's working all the time on his startup, and it just so happens to be the same startup. So it's perfect. That is so true. You really eliminate that uh, that problem right there. Oh, look, I've loved this, guys. Um, we're going to sort of wrap things up now, but I would um, love any sort of final words. Maybe there's some things that you thought you were going to speak to today that you haven't yet had the chance to and, and close out by telling everyone how they can follow the journey and support you. So, yeah, to follow us, you know, the usual, you know, socials, a uh, quai, um, we tend to use Facebook more than anything else. Uh, otherwise, no, I mean, I, I, you know, go for it. Like I said, you know, trust your gut and go for it and build something. And when you're building it and designing it, think about manufacturing, like Simeon said, and, and about scaling. So for us, it was really about how do we have a global impact? And so that's why we're also so open. Yes, we'll go there. Oh, you need us? Yes, we'll be there. You know, so I think being very open and agile um, is key for, and it has worked out for yeah. us as well. I would like to add just, if, I mean, you know, those ones, the, those that are building AUVs out there and you're going to get clients, never lie to your clients. Be honest with them. They are realistic as well. They work in the water space. They understand the challenges. So you don't have to lie to them and say, okay, well, it's 100% perfect. So on that, on that regard, and also you're going to have a lot of bad days. And, and I mean, a lot of bad days from Some things humor. where you thought humor. that was going to pop up to the surface and it, did st and it didn't, it's going, to, it's going to really suck. And those are the days that you should appreciate. And all, you're going to recover it. You're going to dissect it. You're going to moan about it. Everybody's going to blame each other for the first five minutes. But at the end of the day, really appreciate that journey because that in itself is the journey. That up and down mark, that's where you get five years later, seven years later and go, wow, this is a, look how far I've traveled. Mm, fantastic insights. I love this conversation. Love your work. Can't wait to follow the journey. And we, of course, wish you all the success and the impact. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Can't take the ocean out of me.